Thank you. Now that you're done exercising, I've been asked to tell you that we're going to feed you four or five times today. Um, I actually uh, switched my talk, so I'm going to apologize for this. I didn't realize when I was invited that this session was uh, focusing on obesity, and since my other talk, The Case Against Sugar, uh, doubles up with a lot of what Rob Lustig just said. It, there's also some conflict in how we look at the world, but um, I figured this might be a more appropriate talk, so I hope you'll bear with me. Okay. It's also more thought-provoking because I can't help but try to be provocative. Um, so again, I'm not a physician, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not a nutritionist, I don't have an MD or a PhD. I was trained as a, uh, well, I was a, a physics major who then went into journalism, became an investigative science reporter, and I uh, wrote my first two books on sciences, uh, on uh, physicists who discovered non-existent elementary particles who screwed up. Um, in the course of that, I was, uh, among other things, lied to repeatedly by a Nobel laureate whose work I was chronicling. And um, I d this developed a healthy skepticism for uh, uh, virtually everything. <laughs> um, I was also taught by some of the best experimental scientists in the world, and um, they convinced me that in science, and we often use science as an adjective, things are scientific and that's a good thing, or they're non-scientific and it's a bad thing, but it turns out that there are good scientists and bad scientists, just like there are good doctors and bad doctors and good plumbers and bad plumbers. And so a certain amount of sure that what you're seeing is, is reliable, and as a journalist, I'm, again, probably more skeptical than most. Um, one of the ways I approach my work once I got into public health is to try and figure out why we believe something. So there are certain uh, truisms in the world uh, of uh, medicine and public health. And uh, in med school, you'll be taught that 50% of what's in the textbooks are wrong. We just don't know what 50%. So the way I had, uh, addressed my controversies that I covered first in a series of uh, exposés, investigative reports for the journal Science, is to go back in history and figure out the time at which a field, a, a controversial subject, was most controversial. And at that point, you could see the best evidence being presented by both sides. And then you could go back in history from then. And by the time I got on the subject of obesity and nutrition, the internet had come along, which was a remarkable experiment, scientific tool. There I use that adjective. Remarkable tool to allow a person like myself, for the first time in history, to, in effect, uh, go back and find every primary source on the relevant fields going back to the 19th century. So I started doing this research. Google Books didn't exist. You couldn't just download the sources. Um, this research was based on, uh, this lecture is based on five years of research in which, among other things, I employed students in five different cities whose only jobs were to go to um, the, the local med school libraries, I'd send them lists of 50 uh, references or entire books that I needed copied, and they would copy them and ship back. So in the course of five years, I was able to do more research on this subject than any human being alive. And I could say that um, pretty confidently. And I was the only journalist to ever just simply ask this question in, in the midst of an ob obesity and diabetes epidemics, the likes of which the world has never seen, why have we so completely failed as societies to solve those epidemics? We've made zero progress. And in a circumstance like that, like if this was HIV and HIV rates had continued to increase uh, uh, you know, year to year to year since 1984, 85, when the HIV virus was identified, and if AIDS mortality had continued to increase despite the creation of drugs based on our understanding of the HIV virus, we would be wondering what it is about the etiology of this disease that we don't understand, and we would be calling our uh, public health authorities to the mat asking why they haven't solved this problem. You know, if Ebola was everywhere today, instead of having been, uh, that epidemic having been successfully contained, we would wonder what it is we don't understand about the disease, and we would be calling our public health authorities, asking, there would be, you wouldn't be able to cross the street without passing teams of researchers in white suits trying to figure out what they missed. 
about their understanding of the cause of, obese, of, of Ebola or of AIDS or of lung cancer, or any epidemic that continued to increase. And yet with obesity and diabetes, we just consider it sort of business as usual. We assume that we understand the cause of these diseases, but we don't question it. We don't say maybe we missed something. So in effect, as a journalist, I was, again, and I could say this confidently, the only journalist who ever approached this from the perspective of maybe the scientists got it wrong. Maybe we don't understand these diseases. And I'm going to give you a hint. When Rob Lustig said he would hunt you down if you talk about counting calories, which I know they don't do in Canada. <laughs> so Rob can relax today. His job is done. Anyway. OK, so why we get fat? That's the talk. That was the episode. Um, Context, obviously, and again, I apologize, these are US-centric slides because 99% of my talks are in the US and I never thought before I came here to turn them into Canadian slides. <laughs> epidemic, we have an obesity epidemic. You guys know this, it's clear. We have a diabetes epidemic that goes with it. Um, the diabetes numbers are even more uh, uh, dramatic in my book, The Case Against Sugar. What I'm basically arguing is that sugar is the cause of the diabetes epidemic. Okay, so when Rob said that sugar consumption can explain 29% of diabetes, I argue that sugar consumption can explain probably about 95% of diabetes. Okay, that book's for sale here, it's worth reading, that's not what this talk is about. In the U.S., if you go back to 1960, diabetes prevalence has increased 700%. That's a national disaster. And that's what I mean. How can you have a slide like this and say, we understand what causes this disease? Okay, obesity. With obesity comes a whole cluster of chronic uh, diseases. It uh, increases the risk of the fatter you get, it, the greater your risk of stroke, heart disease, gallbladder disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, which is an effective disease of insulin resistance, hypertension, neurodegeneration, which includes Alzheimer's. Uh, fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, cancer, the conventional wisdom. Do we have a laser printer, by the way? A laser pointer, by any chance? The conventional wisdom is that whatever, that, that as you get fatter, there's something about the condition of being fatter, maybe the, uh, uh, the inflammatory molecules released that increase the risk of other diseases, and an alternative causality would be to say that whatever makes you fat is the same thing that causes these diseases. It's a more simplistic causality, and we'll get to that in a second. But what it means is, although this talk is called Why We Get Fat, it could be called Why We Get Sick, because I'm positing that whatever it is, thanks. Whatever it is that, that, that causes obesity also causes these metabolic diseases, both directly and through um, obesity. So here's a conventional wisdom. You could used to be, you could, well, you could probably still find a, a line like this on effectively every um, uh, health, public health website in the world. Uh, the reason I'm caveating that now is because the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. recently stopped including this line, which I consider somewhat of a victory. Um, so the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. So by that thinking, obesity is what's called an energy balance disorder. That's a technical terminology. So calories in are greater than calories out. And that's why we get fat. And the short form is we overeat. Biblical terms for this would be gluttony and sloth. And, <laughs> you know, I wish that wasn't so resonates. But basically, we're still working on a biblical theory of the disease. Um, Okay, so one of the things you want to do in science, the key thing you want to do in science is you want to explain what you observe. Okay, either in nature, the laboratory, you know, the creation of the universe. So in one way or the other, we observe things and we want to explain them. What we're observing now is the obesity epidemic. So we want to take this overeating uh, hypothesis, this energy balance hypothesis, and explain the obesity epidemic. And the way we do it is we say that increasing prosperity makes people, you know, gives uh, greater access to energy dense foods. Uh, another definition is a toxic, obesogenic environment. By the way, increased prosperity, one of uh, the, your deans who introduced this, remember, said obesity is a problem both in the richest societies and the poorest societies. So right there you would start questioning whether or not prosperity has anything to do with it. 
But this idea of a toxic obesogenic environment, then we have to define obesogenic environment. This is how Kelly Brown now, who's now dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke, did it a few years ago. We said cheeseburgers and french fries, drive-in windows and supersizes, soft drinks and candy, potato chips and cheese curls, once unusual or as much our background as trees, grass and clouds. Few children walk or bike to school. There's little phys ed. Everything uh, conspires to keep our children inside. Certainly my kids succumb to all of that stuff. So basically there's all these factors that drive up consumption and drive down expenditure. And you end up with a hypothesis that looks like this. So too much food, too little physical activity leads to overeating, energy in greater than energy out, and the result is obesity and the obesity epidemic. That's the gist of the conventional thinking. And by the way, I'm talking fast because I have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm both trying to sell you something, which is why I'm talking fast, but I'm doing it for a reason. Okay, how many of you generally believe that this is true? Okay, I know you don't count calories. <laughs> but do you generally believe that this hypothesis is true? Yeah. That the reason people get fatter is they take in more calories than they expend for all this? Okay. So a few of you, like 10%, I could have given my sugar talk. Um, <laughs> it's a hypothesis, okay? Like anything, it could be absolutely fundamentally true, but the way I approach it is, or actually I didn't even approach it like this, I stumbled on the fact that this was a hypothesis. Clearly it is might be a true one. And you could ask the question with any hypothesis, is it true? Okay? And the funny thing is, it has a history. It's not passed down on tablets, you know, like the Ten Commandments. It has a history, and when you go back in the literature, it dates back actually to the early 20th century and a German diabetes specialist named Carl von Norden. And then it was promoted by Louis Newberg, uh, an American physiologist and researcher at the University of Michigan. And it's based on the laws of thermodynamics, clearly. Um, it comes out of the 1880s after uh, physiologists demonstrated that the laws of thermodynamics hold true for humans as well as inanimate objects. And then uh, in the 1890s, these two American scientists showed that thermodynamics holds true for humans. And they pioneered the science of calorimetry and the energy going into people could be measured for the first time ever. And they started doing it. And we started focusing on, you know, calorimetry is is a word that's obviously based on the same root as calories. So we started focusing on this energy idea. And in the 1900s, von Norden, around 1903, 1907, declared that caloric imbalance was the cause of obesity. The way he put it, he said, the ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat and to obesity if you keep it up. Okay, and then Lewis Newberg took it over in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and became, in effect, the leading authority, or the leading, the most influential authority in the U.S. on obesity. And Newberg had one revelation that really drove his work, and it was based on the work of a, a German researcher named Hilda Brook, who we'll come back to. But the revelation was that all obese persons are alike in one fundam fundamental respect. They literally overeat. Okay, and that's true. And therefore, if obesity, if all obese people are, 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 are overeat, then obesity is caused by what Newberg called either a perverted appetite, eating too much, or a lessened outflow of energy, insufficient expenditure. So you have this balance between calories in and calories out. And it looks like this. So the focus of attention is a full body. More energy comes in, less energy goes out. The body increases in mass. You get fatter. Okay, there was a problem with this, so, which is how much you eat and how much you exercise you basically determine their behaviors. Okay, so the, the question was always, why don't obese people compensate by eating less or exercising more? You can do that. You can decrease your intake and increase your expenditure. They're under conscious control. And Newberg, I included his photo. I couldn't resist. Okay, I, <laughs> I don't believe somebody who looks like this can understand human obesity. <laughs> Okay. And I'll give you a metaphor. I have male friends who are obstetricians and have delivered thousands of children, babies, and I don't believe they can understand childbirth as well as one woman who's given birth. Okay? Until you've actually understood what it means to get fatter day in and day out, regardless of how much you eat and exercise, you don't know what it is you're trying to explain. Okay? Remember, science is about observing and explaining. 
If you're observing your own struggles with weight, you're trying to explain something different than if you're observing other people's. Okay, because if you're observing other people, you could say they suffer from various human weaknesses, such as overindulgence and ignorance, and you think you've solved the problem. So what you've done is you've taken a physiological defect in the body, and you've turned it into a mental character issue. Ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth. Okay? And then you could say simple things. We can look for counterexamples. That's what you do in science. When you have a hypothesis, the first thing you do is, are there any obvious examples of populations or people or circumstances? Can we create an experiment, something to refute our hypothesis? Black swans. And as it turns out in the literature, and I'm the only person to ever accumulate these studies, and I hate to keep repeating that, but I have to justify why a journalist is talking to you about this. You can go back in the data and find populations that had very high levels of obesity, okay? A lot of them were native uh, uh, aboriginal populations, and that had none of these toxic obesogenic characteristics that Kelly Brownell describes. So they were incredibly poor populations. The 1928 Sioux, this was immediately after a government study in 1927 of the, the um, uh, 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 conditions on the Native American reservations in the U.S. in which they said they were unimaginably poor. And yet 40% of the women and 25% of the children were distinctly fat on this population. And this is a, a coexistence of obesity and malnutrition in the same population um, that today is referred to as a double or dual burden of obesity and malnutrition. And then the question becomes, and you can go down in all these populations where you see in 1961-63 in Trinidad, there was a, 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 a health crisis in Trinidad. The U.S. government sends a team of nutritionists down to check it out. And they come back and they report that a third of the women over 25 are obese and that obesity is a potentially serious medical problem. This is 1961. And yet the next year, they sent an MIT nutritionist went down to quantify the diet being consumed and reported that these people weren't even getting as much food as the FAO was suggesting was necessary for a healthy diet. Um, Bantu pensioners in South Africa in 1964, this is the poorest of a disenfranchised black population in South Africa in the midst of the apartheid era, and the mean weight of women over 60 is 165 pounds, and 30% are seriously overweight. How did they get there if what they have to do is eat too much? So the shrug of the shortcomings of the energy balance hypothesis are easy to find if you go looking for them. So for starters, if eating too much causes you to gain weight, you should be able to eat less and lose the weight. Okay, today you'll read reports about what happens when the biggest losers try to lose 400 pounds and how that affects their metabolism. But they weren't always 400 pounds overweight. At one point, they were only 10 pounds overweight or 20 pounds overweight. Or for the rest of us, it's we recognize our belts too tight. We're five pounds overweight. Why can't we stop it? Why can't we eat less and reverse it then, before any metabolic problems have come in? And yet, when you do these assessments of calorie-restricted diets, you find that they just don't work. That was first pointed out in a clinical report in the late 1950s, but it was clear to anyone who studied obesity. Hilda Brook, who I mentioned, she was a German pediatrician who came over in the U.S. in 1933, as many German Jews did. And she was walking around the streets in New York in 1934, stunned by how fat the kids were in New York City. She said, not just fat, but roly-poly fat kids in 1934, in the very single worst year of the Depression. And so she started the first obesity clinic at Columbia, in the, in the pediatric obesity clinic in the world at Columbia University. In 1957, she wrote this, this very thoughtful book, The Importance of Overweight, and she talked about why eating less doesn't work. And she said this, more than in any other illness, a physician is called upon only to do a special trick, to make the patient do something. Stop eating after it's already been proved that he cannot do it. Every obese person knows they're supposed to eat less. Having a doctor in a white coat tell you or a dietitian tell you doesn't change their inherent knowledge. If they're still obese, it means that eating less failed. The other problem is exercising more doesn't work. Okay? And this has been documented in clinical trial after clinical trial, and I could show you the meta-analyses. I find this statement more compelling, okay? In 2007, the American Heart Association, the American College of Sports Medicine, wrote joint physical activity guidelines. And these are people who think we should all be physically active, as do I. And they think we should all do what you guys just did. 
okay? And you'd expect them to spin the data to make that point as strongly as they can, but instead, this is what they say. It's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures. Which is the equivalent of saying it's reasonable to assume that if I'm a couch potato and I become a marathon runner, I'm less likely to gain weight over time than if I remain a couch potato. And they say so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. This hypothesis is 100 to 150 years old. So the point is, it doesn't mean it's not true. It might be. Maybe we never did the studies right, or we didn't do enough exercise, or enough, you know, who knows. But the point is, if after 150 years, the best you could say about a hypothesis, the data support are not particularly compelling, it's a pretty good chance the hypothesis is wrong. So now let me give you a different way to think about this. Um, imagine, well, you guys are being fed five times today. Did you know that? <laughs> Imagine in the invitations to come here, not only are you being fed, you're being fed by some of the best chefs, young chefs in Toronto. Okay? So imagine in the invitation that you were told you are going to be fed four to five times today and it's going to be enormous amounts of food, the likes of which you've never seen course after course after course <laughs> of a veritable feast. Bring your appetite. Come hungry. What would you do? to make sure that you got here hungry, you would work out. Okay, there used to be a concept called building up an appetite. Remember that? That's what you did when you worked out. What else might you do? Eat less the day before or that morning? You might also say, geez, George Brown University is only seven miles from where I live. I think I'll walk because <laughs> I'm going to build up an appetite. The two things that any normal human being would do to assure that they get hungry, eat less and exercise more, the two things we tell obese people to do to lose weight. There's something wrong with that right there. Does that begin to tell you we may have a failed paradigm on our hands? Okay, here's another problem, energy and balance. Okay, we're all about calorie balance. The CDC tells us in the US that weight management is all about balance, balancing the number of calories you consume with the number of calories your body uses and burns off. How many of you, when you go to the gym or do the little exercise you just did, think about how many calories you're burning? Like if you get on one of those uh, machines, you look at the calorie count. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, so what does this mean? That's the question. I'm gonna show you what it means. I'm gonna use an analysis that was done in 1937 that I first saw by Eugene Dubois, who was a leading expert in metabolism in the United States pre-World War II. And he did this calculation for the very same reason I'm doing it, okay? To discuss the concept, this concept. Okay, so a typical adult's food intake in the U.S. is around 2,700 calories a day. That's average men and women, okay? So that's about a million calories a year. It's about 10 million calories in a decade. It's about 10 tons of food over the course of a decade. Now, we want to ask the question, how carefully do we have to balance calories in to calories out so we don't gain any more than two pounds of fat a year? Because if we gain two pounds of fat a year, that's 20 pounds in a decade. Okay, that's 40 pounds between your 20s and your 40s. You'll go from being lean in your 20s to obese in your 40s unless you cannot do this. So what does that take? You gotta balance calories into calories out to 21 calories a day. Or let me rephrase it this way. If you store 21 calories a day in your fat tissue that you do not burn, you will gain two pounds a year. Here's the calculation. It's uh, probably eighth grade math. I actually think my sixth grader, he should be able to do it, but I can't swear to it. <laughs> That's why he's in. Um, he's getting uh, tutoring this summer. Um, 20 calories a day times 365 days a year times 10 years divided by 3,500 calories per pound of fat, which is a reasonable estimate, is 21 pounds in a decade. Okay, it is 0.8% accuracy, not that it matters. I'm a big guy. Let's say I eat 3,000 calories a day. Okay, and I'm going to say that comes in uh, 20 calories a day as a bite of food, so that's 150 chews of bite swallows of food, you know, live fluids and, 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 and foods. If I burn off or excrete 149 of them, and the 150th ends up in my fat tissue, 
I am destined to become obese. Okay? Destined. You're telling me, how do you avoid that 150th getting there if that's all it takes? Okay, this is what Dubois said about this. He worked out this calculation. And he said, considering this, there is no stranger phenomenon than the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. How do we do it? I mean, maybe you can do it. You can argue that we do it because we look in the mirror, we see we're getting fatter, so we undershoot. So we basically, or our pants start getting tight. So we oscillate between weight stability, weight maintenance, and you know, gaining and losing. But remember, even obese people are in weight maintenance. They are balancing their calories into their calories out. They're not gaining weight. They might be 50 or 100 pounds overweight, but they're not continuing to gain two pounds a year. At some point, you reach weight maintenance. How do you do it if it requires, in effect, perfect energy balance? It's a crazy concept. How did we ever get here? OK, so now I'm going to show you some photos of uh, naked human beings, for which I apologize. These photos <laughs> come from pre-World War II textbooks. OK, pre-World War II, something I didn't realize prior to my research, uh, the best medical science in the world was done in Germany and Austria. And the lingua franca of medical science was German. If you wanted to be a serious researcher, you had to read German, and ideally you spoke German as well, so you could go to Germany or Austria and you could uh, intern or study with these hair professor doctor types who had basically pioneered every field of medicine that was relevant to obesity. So nutrition, metabolism, genetics, chronic disease, endocrinology, they all grew up and matured in Germany and Austria. These were the best scientists in the world. Okay, just as they were in physics. If I asked you to name five famous physicists, um, from the 20th century, they would probably be people like Eisen, Einstein and Schopenhauer and, and, and uh, uh, Heisenberg and, and Planck, all, all Eastern Europeans, basically. That's where science was honed to a fine edge. So in, they were interested in obesity, clearly, and they thought, well, what's interesting, if you look at obesity, just BMI, and you say somebody's obese if they have a BMI over 30, you don't really know much about it. You have no, no idea they could be muscular, they could be lean, they could be fat here, they could be fat here. You don't know when they got fat, you don't know where they got fat. So they were interested in all those questions because they were interested in observing things about obesity so they could understand how to explain what they were observing, a viable hypothesis. So the first thing they said is, look, Look at genetics. We know that obesity has a huge genetic component, in part because identical twins don't just have the same faces, they have the same bodies. So here's a lean pair of identical twins and an obese pair of identical twins. And the lean pair, their fat distribution is virtually identical. They apparently also practice perfect energy balance. And the obese pair, well, their body fat accumulation is also identical. So what controls that? Maybe they took in more calories than they expended. Surely they did to accumulate that excess fat, but why is their body fat go to the same places? What do the calories have to do with that? How does a hypothesis of obesity as an energy balance disorder explain that in any way? How does studying how much they eat and exercise explain that in any way? What am I doing? Wrong one. Too many controls. Um, you could ask the same question with animal husbandry, okay? You could use this as another example. So on the left is a lean breed of cattle. It's a Jersey cow. It's a dairy cow. You could see the swollen udder in the photo. Um, the right is a, a meat cow. It's an Aberdeen Angus. And you can see it's a big, fat, bulky, stocky animal. And it's got a lot of fatty accumulation in the meat. And you just ask this question. We know it's genetic because they're different breeds, right? What controls why this animal is stocky and this animal is lean? Is it how much they eat and exercise? Do the genes determine like, that maybe the Jersey likes to go for jogs when it gets dark at night and the Aberdeen <laughs> Angus goes in and watches TV? Or the Jersey takes smaller bites or chews more mindfully? <laughs> Let's think of a different thing. I mean, this producing milk is very expensive, okay? I mean, energy expensive. It takes an extraordinary amount of energy to do that. So maybe the genes that determine this, maybe this animal has been bred such that the energy that comes in gets directed to the udder to produce milk, and they, you don't want it accumulating here as protein and fat because all you want out of this animal is milk, whereas this one, you do want it accumulating. 
So maybe these genes are genes that determine how we partition fuels, how we use the fuels we take in. So it's not about how much we take in or expend, it's how we use it. What Rob said earlier, it's not that you aren't what you eat, you are what your body does with what you eat. So maybe in this animal, the body takes the calories and turns it into milk, and there aren't enough calories in the body. It's not trying to accumulate fat and protein. Maybe this animal is trying something different. So we can look at sexual variations. Men accumulate fat above the waist. This is uh, apple-shaped obesity. Women accumulate calories below, fat below the waist. This man doubled his risk of heart disease. By getting fat above the waist, this woman did not. What do the calories have to do with it? What does this energy balance idea tell us about? I want a hypothesis of obesity that could tell us why the fat went here on him and there on her, okay? I mean, that would be a nice thing to explain. There are other, there are localized fat distribution, steatopygia in, in African tribes women, okay? This woman will accumulate that fat regardless of how much she eats and exercises. I would like a hypothesis that tells me why. Because it's not just obesity. I want a hypothesis of adiposity. Why, where, when? Puberty is a question of when, okay? So boys and girls um, enter puberty with roughly the same amount of body fat. As they go through puberty, they both get bigger and heavier. So they both get, accumulate body mass. They're clearly taking in more calories than they're expending. What's interesting is the boys lose fat and gain muscle. And the girls gain fat, and they gain fat in very specific places. Girls get fatter in puberty. Boys get more muscular in puberty. What does the caloric intake and expenditure have to do with that fat? If I ask you to explain why that girl got fatter and why she got fatter in very specific places that perhaps may have been carefully crafted by evolution to drive the boys crazy, <laughs> What do the calories have to do with it? Does the energy balance hypothesis give us any answer to that question? Clearly, it's dominated by hormones. They got taller because they were secreting growth hormone, which stimulating insulin-like growth factor. The boys lost fat and gained muscle because of the action of testosterone primarily, and that's why they become unreasonable and insane, and the girls <laughs> gained fat and gained it in very specific places because of the way the cells in those places respond to the female sex hormones. How much they eat and exercise is irrelevant. In fact, I'll probably do this even to the point of starvation. You can inhibit it with starvation, but that's about all you can say. Okay, so why do we believe this? The answer is physics. I told you it's the laws of thermodynamics. This is considered, you know, the God, this is God's rule to, you know, people who study obesity, the first law of thermodynamics. It's the only one that's easy to understand, which is a blessing, because the other two are difficult. Um, delta E is the energy stored in the system, and this, basically this is a law of energy conservation, so you've heard this, it says energy can either be created or destroyed, it can only change form. So out of this we get this very simplistic idea that says delta E, the amount of energy in a system is equal to the EN, the energy in the system, minus the energy that goes out of the system, and we, in, 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 uh, health and obesity, we say delta E is fat mass, so change in fat mass is equal to the energy consumed minus the energy expended, which may or may not be true, but this is certainly true. It's gotta be, okay? It's like saying that a room gets more crowded because more people enter than leave, okay? It's a, just, it's, you know, you make more money, you get richer when you make more money than you spend, okay? That's what that rule says. The problem is there's no arrow of causality here. And we turn this into an arrow of causality. So we say, if, you know, if somebody eats more, and they don't exercise more than delta E goes up, therefore, causality, eating too much causes obesity. And if somebody exercises less and doesn't rein in their appetite, therefore, delta E goes up. So we add a causality that doesn't exist. And we end up with this idea that changes in intake and expenditure cause changes in fat mass. Too many arrows. This is how Jean Mayer put it in 1954. He said, obesity, too many people believe, is explained by overeating. Actually, it should be recognized that this is simply restating the problem in a different way and reaffirming somewhat unnecessarily one's faith in the first law of thermodynamics. 
To explain obesity by overeating is as illuminating a statement as an explanation of alcoholism by chronic overdrinking. I mean, imagine if I was giving a lecture today on wealth accumulation, and you said, Gary, you know, why do people get, how do I get rich? And I said, or how did Bill Gates get rich? And I say, well, he took in more money than he spent. <laughs> Have I told you anything meaningful? I mean, Warren Buffett took in more money than he spent also, and he got rich in an entirely different way, and I take in more money than I spend, and I'm not rich. What if I was giving a lecture on climate change, another vitally important subject, and you said, Gary, why is the atmosphere heating up? And I said, because it's taking in more energy than it expends. <laughs> I mean, clearly it is, and yet that's not an explanation. That's a statement of a fact. If it's taking in more energy than it explains, it's got to be heating up and vice versa. Okay? This idea that taking in more calories than you expend is the cause of obesity is nonsensical. Okay, Wolfgang Pauli, a famous uh, theoretical physicist also from Eastern Europe, would have said, it's not even wrong. That's how bad it is. And this is the fundamental fact of our nutrition science, okay? All of nutrition science is based on this simple fact that makes no sense whatsoever. Another Pauliism was to call something spherically senseless. It was, makes no sense no matter what direction you look at it. We need an explanation. If somebody's getting fatter, they're taking in more calories than they expend. That's what, that was the um, Newberg's revelation. They literally overeat. They are literally taking in more calories than they expend, but that tells you nothing about why they're getting fatter. It tells nothing about when they're getting fatter, where they're getting fatter, why they're taking in more calories than they expend, which is what we want to know. The fact that they're taking in more calories than they expend is just another way of saying they're getting fatter unless they're growing, in which case they're still taking more calories, but that's not overeating, or they're getting more muscular, in which case they're taking... So you can see the problem. So there is an alternative hypothesis. This too had history. Okay, and this alternative hypothesis, it starts with a first principle. Okay, I know about first principles because Hannibal Lecter told Clarice in Silence of the Rams that Marcus Aurelius thought you should begin with first principles. I couldn't actually find it in Marcus Aurelius, so I quote Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, okay? If you see somebody and they're obese, that's, you have no idea how much they eat or exercise. You shouldn't even care how much they eat or exercise. I'll track you down. <laughs> Me and Rob, both. <laughs> Obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation. Describe it what you see, no assumptions. Okay, and if it's a sort of excess fat accumulation, it's not necessarily energy balance or overeating or sedentary behavior. Those are all assumptions. But if you start with that single sentence, you ask the question, what regulates fat accumulation? I mean, if you're a doctor, you should say, gee, I wonder what regulates fat accumulation. By this hypothesis, overeating and activity are compensatory effects. They're not causes, and we don't get fat because we overeat. We overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat, and I'll explain both of these. So we switch the direction of causality. By that, I mean the first law of thermodynamics says that changes in intake and expenditure will change body mass, fat mass. The causality goes this way. And in our alternative hypothesis, it says the body, the mass stored in the human body is very well regulated, just like everything else is, like your blood pressure and your you know, heart rate. And you have to dysregulate this to get fatter, and if you dysregulate it, you will get changes in intake and expenditure, because you have to. The laws of thermodynamics tell us that's true. So here's an analogy and a, a thought experiment that I'm going to give you, um, just to think about it. So this fellow right here in the photo, Carl Anthony Towns, at the time was a senior at the University of Kentucky. He was predicted to be the first uh, number one draft in the NBA draft this year. He was drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves. He's now a young superstar. There was an article about him in the New York Times that described the growth spurt he went through when he went to high school. He said, there just never seemed to be enough food to satiate Towns' growing body. After school, he would eat a foot-long sub before his mother's home-cooked dinners, even after having a hefty lunch of homemade chicken rice and vegetables and his favorite snacks, granola bars and bunch of crunch. I'm going to go broke if my kids do this. <laughs> okay? In technical term for this is hyperphagia. Okay? This kid had an enormous appetite. Now, what's interesting is Carl Anthony grew to be seven feet tall and 250 pounds. He was going through a growth spurt, so his BMI was never 25. He never got even really to overweight. So when we want to understand his growth spurt and his hyperphagia, 
But we know is all that hunger came because he was growing, right? We have phrases for that. My teenage kids ate me out of house and home, or they lied around the house all day. Growth causes changes in appetite. Okay, so Carl Anthony Towns was growing when he was in high school. He ate all the time. I created, in the thought experiment, I gave Carl Anthony a, uh, a fraternal twin brother, Anthony Carl, who didn't quite grow as high. <laughs> Anthony Carl was six feet 250. Okay, so he was a foot shorter, but the same weight, which means he was in exactly the same amount of positive energy balance as his brother Carl, Anthony. But with, and so he probably ate the same kind of food and he was probably just as hungry in high school. But yet with Carl Anthony, we switch. Anthony Carl, we switch the causation. So here we assume that he got fat because he either ate too much or exercised too little. So here's Anthony Carl, growth causes change in intake and expenditure. Carl Anthony, changes in intake and expenditure cause growth. And there's absolutely no reason to do that. And I challenge, I've given plenty of talks in medical schools, I've challenged physicians to find any other example in nature or in the medical textbooks where growth actually is caused by changes in intake and expenditure rather than vice versa. Or, for that fact, any other condition in their medical textbooks where they would defer to physics for the solution rather than medicine. Okay, so here's the alternative hypothesis. It had a history. It was a German-Austrian hypothesis pre-World War II. The primary proponents were Gustav von Bergmann, who was a leading authority in clinical medicine in Germany prior to World War II. Today, the, one of the most uh, respected awards of the German Society of Internal Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Medal. And then Julius Bauer, who was a pioneer in the fields of endocrinology and chronic disease at the University of Vienna in Austria, one of the great universities in the world prior to World War II. Um, here's how Bauer described this theory. So he used the term lipophilic, which meant love of fat. And the idea is that some tissue is lipophilic and other tissue isn't. Some tissue wants to accumulate fat and other tissue doesn't. Our, we don't accumulate fat on our foreheads or the back of our hands, but we do accumulate fat elsewhere and we all know where those places are. <laughs> and they're different on everyone. Why is that? Like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus or the breast of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue, tissue that wants to accumulate fat, seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. So even if somebody's trying to eat less or a population is malnourished and lacks food, you could still have its fat tissue trying to seize on foodstuffs, just like a tumor would and maintains its stock, may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. A lipomatous subject may die of starvation and still remain lipomatous. Meaning, you can take a fat person and starve them to death before you will turn them into a lean person, just like you could take a basset hound and starve it to death before you'll turn into a greyhound. Eric Graff, who wrote the seminal textbook, Metabolic Diseases and Their Treatment, this was a German textbook. In the early 1930s, Eugene Dubois asked Graff to write an English version because we had nothing like that in the backwaters of North America. Graff was a, ran a famous clinic at Würzburg. He described this hypothesis as a condition of abnormally facilitated fat production and impeded fat destruction, a sort of lipo lipomatosis universalis in the sense that the lipophilia in certain issue, tissues is primary and the sparing in the energy expenditure is secondary. It presupposes overnutrition. If somebody's body is regulated to store calories as fat, they will by definition take in more calories than they expend because their body's getting bigger. The question is how they'll do it. It's a good working hypothesis. Russell Wilder was a leading authority on diabetes and obesity at the Mayo Clinic pre-World uh, War II. During World War II, he went to become the first director of the Food and Nutrition uh, Board in Washington. He said the effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation, even a little more fat than usual, might well count both for delayed sense of satiety, for the frequently abnormal taste for carbohydrate encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction would have a profound effect in the, over the course of time. Remember, 20 calories a day. All you have to do is have a dysregulation that stores 20 calories a day and you end up with obesity. 
This hypothesis deserves attentive consideration, Wilder said. Hugo Roney was a Hungarian uh, endocrinologist who came to the U.S. in the 1920s, wrote the first monograph on obesity and leanness in the U.S. in 1940s, said this theory was strongly supporting the theory, which is now more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany, by a number of leading investigators. And then it vanishes. Okay, the war comes. This is a German-Austrian hypothesis. The lingua franca of medicine is German pre-World War II. Post-World War II, we have a society of young doctors and nutritionists and others who have very good reasons to not like the Germans and Austrians and don't want to read the German and Austrian literature. This hypothesis literally vanishes. You can see it happen in the literature. So Bauer, a German-Austrian Jew, fled to the U.S. in 1938. And in 1941, he wrote an article on obesity and the annals of internal medicine in which he basically ridiculed Newberg's hypothesis using a lot of the thinking I did today for how nonsensical this energy conception was and explained why obesity had to be a hormonal regulatory disorder. And his paper was published 10, was cited 10 times by 1941 and then never again until my books came out 40 years later, 60 years later. Newberg, Lewis Newberg, in 1943 wrote a response to Bauer that ridiculed Bauer's hypothesis, and Newberg's theory became the basis for all thinking that followed. Okay, you are literally watching a paradigm dying, and it's dying in the midst of World War II, in part because it's a German-Austrian hypothesis. The interesting thing is, if you look at animal models of obesity, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens, virtually all of them support the Newberg, the, the Bauer hypothesis. So Jean Mayer was a leading nutritionist in the U.S. by the 1960s. When he was in the 1950s, he studied an obese strain of mice, and he said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. This is true of all these obesity models. You can half starve these animals, and they will die with their fat tissue mostly intact. Okay, it's, they don't get fat because they eat too much. They get fat and stay fat if they eat at all. Eating too much has nothing to do with it. So if obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, a hormonal regulatory disorder, the question is what regulates fat accumulation? That's what we should have been asking for the past 70 years. Okay, unfortunately we couldn't figure it out until the 1960s. We didn't have the technology available. The Germans and Austrians didn't have the technology available to understand the hormonal regulation of fat tissue because we couldn't measure hormones in the bloodstream until 1960 with the discovery by Rosalind Yallow and Solomon Burson that later won Yallow the Nobel Prize and was um, uh, discussed by the Nobel Committee as basically revolutionizing the whole science of endocrinology. So you ask this simple question, okay, what we want to know is why fat cells get fat, okay? And so here's a diagram of a fat cell with a cell membrane, and you could ask, here's where the laws of thermodynamics come. If more energy goes into the fat cell than comes out, the fat cell is clearly getting fatter. So the question is, what regulates this? The conventional wisdom is somehow too much energy floats around out here, and it kind of floats around through here, and it kind of ends up in here, and that's why you get fat. But in the 1960s, this was all worked out very carefully. And what we know is that fatty acids come to the bloodstream as triglycerides and lipoproteins, like LDL cholesterol, the same you know, LDL we worry about, perhaps incorrectly, in heart disease. Um, there, uh, 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 enzymes on the cell membrane, lipoprotein lipases, that reach into these, L these lipoproteins, break down the triglycerides into fatty acids, which is absolutely careful because a fatty acid is smaller than the triglycerides, so the fatty acid can actually pass through the membrane of the cell, get into the fat, uh, the fat cell itself, and then in the fat cell, it's called a sterified, uh, glycerol molecules attached to the fatty acids, and you end up with a triglyceride. And we store fat as triglycerides because triglycerides are bigger and they can't get out of the fat cell. And if you want to get the fat out, if you want to use it, you have to break the triglyceride down into the component fatty acids and glycerol. And we have these other enzymes called hormone-sensitive lipases primarily that do that job. So all of this was worked out in the 1960s. So in effect, anything that works to get fatty acids into the fat cell and a them as triglycerides works to make the fat cell fatter and so you fatter. And anything that works to break down the triglycerides into fatty acids and get them out 
so they can be used for fuel out here works to make you thinner. Okay, it's pretty much that simple. And again, it wasn't worked out until the 1960s. But by the 1960s, Newberg's thinking had so infected the field that all of obesity research was being done by, mostly by psychiatrists and psychologists who were trying to alter the behavior of the fat person. Endocrinologists didn't do this work, so they didn't care. So what happened is you had this disassociation of science where the textbooks would explain why a fat cell gets fat, but it wouldn't be relevant to why a human gets fat. Now, I'll show you that in a second, too. So by 1965, Yalo and Burson, with their very first papers with the radium amino assay, studied what was going on with fat cells, and they had established that the hormone insulin is the principal regulator of fat metabolism. And here's a, a graph, a, a diagram from a 2010 textbook by the leading uh, authority on fatty acid metabolism in the world, Keith Frayn, and it shows fat storage and fat mobilization and what regulates it. It's insulin, 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 and then other hormones a little bit. Um, here's the same thing. If you want to suppress the mobilization of fat from fat tissues, if you think of um, obesity as a fat trapping disorder, it's not just getting more in, it's getting less out. Again, it's insulin, insulin, insulin. And as Yalo and Burson said, release of fatty acids requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency from a biological perspective instead of a physics perspective. If you want to get fat out of a fat cell, you've got to lower insulin, okay? And then the question is, how do you do that? And if you want to get fat stuck in a fat cell, you elevate insulin, as happens in, among other disorders, as type 2 diabetes. So insulin is a fat storage and mobilization. This is just an illustration in a 2001 textbook. Um, this is a woman who had type 1 diabetes, and she was diagnosed at 17, and for the next 50 years, she gave, 49 years, she gave herself her insulin shots in the same two spots in her thighs, and she ends up with these huge fat deposits, and this photo is used to illustrate a box on insulin and fat storage, which says the overall action of insulin on the fat cell is to stimulate fat storage and inhibit mobilization. The argument is we've been doing to ourselves what this woman did to her thighs for the last 50 years. So here are the key points of fat cell regulation. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. That's textbook science. It's in endocrinology textbooks and biochemistry textbooks. When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink, and that's textbook science also. And we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrate content of our diet. Okay, so that's all textbook science. And you end up with this. George Cahill was one of the leading authorities. He was at Harvard in the 60s. He edited a textbook on this science in 1965. And as he put it to me, he said, carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. So this is textbook science. If you take out these three words, is driving insulin, you have the logical equivalent, carbohydrate is driving fat. But now you have quackery. Now you have the Atkins diet. Now a calorie is no longer a calorie. Now there's something unique about carbohydrates that drive fat accumulation. Textbook science, textbook science, textbook science, textbook science, remove these three words and you're at quackery. That's why I didn't even use the word carbohydrate until now. Because when I talk to medical schools, the doctors are with me and with me and they're thinking how thoughtful I am and thought-provoking and I get to that sentence, and they're like, oh my god, it's the Atkins diet, he snuck up on me, he's a quack. <laughs> How did he get there? Jesus, that's not acceptable. Okay, so here's the textbooks. I tell you, this is Leninger's principle of uh, biochemistry. It's the leading, the most uh, authoritative biochemistry textbook they use in U.S. med schools. You look up adipocyte in the... the, the the, the index, you get what makes fat cells fat, high blood glucose, which you get from eating carb-rich meals or being type 2 diabetic, elicits a release of insulin, which speeds the uptake of glucose by tissues, favors the storage of fuels as glycogen, that's the storage form of carbohydrates and triglycerols, while inhibiting fatty acid mobilization in adipose tissue. What makes fat people fat? Yeah, they eat too much. These are two different paradigms. They're two entirely different paradigms, and yet this one is so overwhelmingly believed and so powerful and seems so obvious that people never ask themselves, wait a minute, this is a different idea entirely. 
Okay, then I'm just pointing this out. This is an article from uh, Science Magazine 2011 on human fatty liver diseases. So this is a hepatocyte, it's a liver cell. When you ask the question, why do hepatocytes get fat? You see carbohydrate intake increases glucose and insulin, which activate transcription factors. Insulin inhibits lipolysis and adipose tissue by suppressing. So we care when we talk about liver cells, but when we talk about fat cells, we're into the gluttony and sloth idea, because that paradigm is too powerful. So here's the alternative hypothesis, like any growth defect, any growth defect. Obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder, like type 2 diabetes. It's fundamentally a disorder of insulin signaling. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are so closely associated that, you know, people call them diabetes. And we don't care. We know that a lot of things are going on in diabetes. It's a very complex disorder. We're willing to discuss it as an insulin signaling problem. Maybe obesity is too, and it's triggered by the carb content of the diet. Now, not all carbs. We don't have to get scared here. Um, bread, cereal, rice, and these are high glycemic index, highly processed carbohydrates. Um, they elevate glucose very... Um, uh, uh, spontaneously when consumed, again, the University of Toronto phrase, high, high GI. You know, the fact that these will stimulate insulin secretion and they're the base of the food guide pyramid, we told people to eat them 6 to 11 times a day, suggests a reason why there's an obesity epidemic. And then sweets, sugar, um, uh, by the mechanisms that Rob talked about earlier. These are actually two different mechanisms, for the most part, by which these work, um, although related. And uh, Green vegetables, very low digestible carb content. Fruit, I'm less uh, fruitophilic than Rob is, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about these and sweets as the cause of obesity. So here's the alternative hypothesis. Refined grains, starches, and sugars dysregulate insulin signaling. The result is excess fat accumulation, obesity, and the obesity epidemic, and de facto also then diabetes and all the diseases that associate with it. Um, implications. You ask the question, how do you get thin by the conventional wisdom? You eat less and exercise more. How do you get thin, decrease excess adiposity? But if you pay attention to the biology and the endocrinology, you remove the fattening carbohydrates and you lower insulin. And then just some his more history. It turns out that from Basically, 1820 to 19, mid-1960s, carbohydrates were considered uniquely fattening, okay? From the practice of medicine written in that farinaceous is starchy, and vegetable foods are fattening, saccharin matter, sugar especially. British Journal of Nutrition, 1963, this was an article co-authored by one of the two leading dietitians in the UK. First sentence, every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. And then we decide that dietary fat causes heart disease. And we put the country on a low-fat diet, and if you're going to take away the fat, you replace it with carbohydrates, and hence the 86 to 11 servings of high GI carbs in the food guide pyramid. Okay, so you take a food that was unique, considered uniquely fattening, and then up until the 1960s, and you turn it into a heart-healthy diet. And if you go back and you look through the literature, which I did, you could find diets for obesity published by medical schools in the late 1940s, early 1950s. I found four of them from pretty good medical schools. Cornell Medical School, Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, and Rush in Chicago. They were all identical to Raymond Green's diet for obesity and the practice of endocrinology. Raymond Green was a brother of Graham Green. He was the leading endocrinologist in the UK. This was the diet, foods to be avoided, bread, everything made with showers, cereals, potatoes, all white root vegetables, foods containing sugar, all sweets. You can eat as much as you like of the following foods, meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, cheese, fruit, except bananas. With the exception of some of the fruit, this is the Atkins diet, published by four major medical schools in the United States and the leading endocrinology textbook in the UK. And what's interesting, you see, they don't have percentages. They don't say you should eat 17% of your food from this and 12% from this and blah, blah, blah. The idea is these are fattening, don't eat them. You avoid them. These are not fattening, so you could eat as much as you like. 
And they didn't realize this because uh, Yalo and Bernstein hadn't come along yet, so they didn't realize why those might be fattening and why those might not be fattening. But once the uh, 1960s came along, the prime suspect would be these are fattening because they stimulate insulin secretion, a lot of it, and they keep insulin elevated. And so your body storing fat rather than oxidizing, these are not fattening. We'll skip that. Okay, um, I'm probably way, way on, way too long. So, um, <laughs> yes, I did. Okay, I'm just going to say. Uh, well, Atkins came along. Atkins came along, published the best-selling book in history, outsold the Bible for a few years. His low-carb diet. So the. American Heart Association decided they had to put a stop to this because they were legitimately afraid that a high-fat diet, so you get rid of the carbs, you replace it with fat, saturated fat. You eat all those animal products. It's a double cheeseburger and bacon. It's Rob's 1,400 calorie a day. What was that burger from? Arby's burger without the bun. It's got to kill you. They were worried, and they were worried. I talked to these people. They were legitimately worried. So they write a critique of Atkins diet, and they say fat is mobilized when insulin secretion diminishes, and yet low-carb diets, which work to diminish insulin, are bizarre concepts of nutrition that should not be promoted. That was the end result. They wanted to get rid of Atkins. They threw out both the baby, which was at bathwater, which was Atkins, and the baby, which was the science of endocrinology. And by the end of the 1970s, and I documented this in my first book, you could actually see this happen in the conferences. The regulation of fatty acid metabolism in the human body was rendered irrelevant to a disorder of excess fatty acid accumulation in order that we could not eat fatty foods because they were afraid and because a lot of thin people who ran the field thought that people got fat because they were gluttons and sloths. Um, thank you very much. I may have taken up time for questions. I don't know. But...